I'm gonna do for Marty, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna welcome everybody. This I tried is it two or three times, but it didn't work, I don't think. All right, well, thanks for giving it a try. Um, good afternoon, I'm Teresa Thomas, and I wanted to welcome every, welcome everybody to our Blind Ability Celebration, our Lunch and Learn meeting for the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. Um, October is Blindness and Vision, uh, Visual Impairment Awareness Month in Kentucky. Uh, it's also um, Medication Safety Month for the Blind and Visually Impaired. It is Disability Awareness Month nationally and probably several other things that I've forgotten, but uh, BCB likes to take this opportunity to celebrate the accomplishments of many of the residents in Kentucky that are visually impaired and have reached many of their goals and accomplishments, and we'd love to share in that. And today we have um, an exciting speaker. Her name is Ren Zimmerman, and she is going to share her story with us of accomplishment. Um, without further ado, Ren, I'll go ahead and mute myself and turn it over to you. And if everyone would keep themselves muted until uh, she's to a point where she will ask for questions, um, it'll just help us with the recording and kind of mute out those background noises. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself and let you take it over, Ren, thanks. Sounds good, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Ren Zimmerman and I am actually a visually impaired, legally blind equestrian athlete. Um, so pretty much I'm gonna talk to you about two separate things. First off is my own personal story and how I've gotten to where I am with competing um, jumping horses. And then the second portion of my talk is gonna be a little bit about kind of my work in trying to advocate for the sport of equestrian show jumping to become a paradiscipline and eventually a Paralympic sport. So that being said, I'm gonna start off with my own story. Um, so pretty much I started wearing glasses when I was in second grade, didn't think anything of it at the time. And then throughout middle school, high school, my eyesight got a little bit worse. And then when I was 17 years old, I was diagnosed with something called Stargardt's macular dystrophy. So as I'm sure a lot of you know, it, this is essentially um, juvenile onset macular degeneration. So the way that we figured out that something was going on was that I was wearing contacts, glasses, and when I went to the eye doctor, they pretty much couldn't get me back to 2020 eyesight. And so from there, um, I went to a few different specialists and they told me actually that they should have caught this much sooner. But unfortunately the ophthalmologist um, was not really paying attention or whatever it was. Um, so they didn't catch it for a while, but yeah. So essentially they were trying to figure out what was wrong with my eyes. I got sent on to multiple uh, retina specialists. And then around Christmas time of my senior year of high school, I was diagnosed with Stargardt's disease. So over time um, it does get worse. So it is progressive degenerative and essentially halfway through college, I became legally blind. And so there was this trajectory of what I had set out on for my life. And in my mind, I had always planned to do a master's and a PhD and go on into the business world. I really was interested in business management um, and organizational behavior. And to go back on the education part of things, um, after college, I took a little bit of time off and I was studying for the GMATs and the GREs to get into grad school. And that's when I started riding at a therapeutic riding center. Um, so I'll go back to that in a minute. But, you know, a, a year after college, then I went off to grad school and I found that with my eyesight getting significantly worse, the coursework was just incredibly difficult. Um, you know, we were having tons of reading um, textbooks, having to work on these spreadsheets and data with other people. Um, and for me, it was just so overwhelming that I kind of realized that the path I'd set out on just wasn't really feasible for me anymore. Um, and that's not to say that I wouldn't have been able to do it, but what I really started to contemplate at that point was quality of life and happiness, which is a huge thing for me. Um, and I never really thought about before I started losing my eyesight. So I will get onto that a little bit later. Um, so going back to that year in between college and grad school, I started riding at a therapeutic riding center. And growing up, I had always been fascinated by horses. I wanted to ride. And unfortunately, I didn't get the opportunity to. My parents thought it was dangerous and it was expensive. So it was only after college that, again, I went to that therapeutic riding center and I started, you know, getting to ride the horses in exchange for helping with the program. And I was putting enough time into this. You know, I was going several days a week and they were kind of letting me 
exercise rides, some of their lesson horses. And I had always had this dream of jumping horses. I mean, that's all I wanted to do. Um, and the instructor there actually told me that because of my eyesight, that was never going to be possible. So instead of kind of taking that as fact, I took that as a challenge accepted. And I decided to move on to a different coach. And I actually got turned down by multiple different trainers before one woman said, yeah, you know, I've never worked with someone with a disability, but I'm willing to try it and we'll see where things go. And so she put me on one of her horses and taught me how to ride horses and how to jump horses. And from there, um, she took me to my first horse show and just kind of believed in me. And it was that one person believing in me that sort of opened up the gates um, for you know the progression of those next few years up until where I'm at now. So, but going back to grad school then, so I had, um, decided that I was actually going to put grad school on hold. And my parents were incredibly mad about that. Um, I had a really nice scholarship and I decided again to put that on hold. So I went back home and then decided to actually move across the country from Portland, Oregon to uh, Kentucky to pursue riding more seriously. And I chose Kentucky um, because it's pretty much the epicenter of the horse world. Um, and it just made sense, you know, to be here if I wanted to be competing at a higher level, if I wanted more opportunities, in my mind, this was the place to be. Um, that being said, there are also the governing bodies for equestrian sport here in Lexington. And so, as I was, I'm going to talk about later, my push to um, advocate for para show jumping, it made the most sense to be in the city where the regulating bodies are to kind of try to, you know, be there in case I needed to set up meetings and do different things like that. Um, so as far as my equestrian, my own personal equestrian endeavors go, I pretty much found a trainer. Um, I have actually worked with multiple different ones here in Lexington now. And I've just sort of been pushing through trying to continue um, to compete at a higher level, train more seriously. And I do compete against able-bodied riders. So when I do go to these horse shows, um, everyone for the most part that I'm competing against does not have a disability. So there are a lot of accommodations and things that I do have to do differently in order to be able to compete at the same level as those people. Um, so going back to, you know, learning how to live with this disability. So when I first got diagnosed, um, I really didn't realize the ramifications that this would have on the rest of my life. I, I was 17 years old and it really didn't mean anything to me. And I, in all honesty, didn't really understand why my parents were so devastated about this diagnosis. And then after that, you know, I went through multiple different stages. Um, so of dealing with blindness. Um, and it's taken me a long time to kind of get to the point and to the outlook and approach that I have now. But there was a period, you know, where I was embarrassed that I had a visual impairment and I did everything I could to cover up that fact and not talk about it and try to be as normal as possible. And then I started to realize that, um, that having a disability, I actually had the power to change the perception about what people with disabilities in particular, visual impairment and blindness are capable of. Someone who doesn't have this disability doesn't really know what it's like to live with this and they, they, they don't have that power. Whereas me personally having this disability, I'm hoping to change people's, people's perceptions. Um, and so I, you know, kind of changed my outlook on this and I decided that I wanted to start putting my story out there in the hopes that it would inspire other people to try to pursue their own passions, whatever they may be. Um, you know, so many people out there tell us as visually impaired and blind people that we can't do something or that that's not possible for us. And I think the most important part is to realize that it doesn't matter what other people think you can or can't do, you have to believe in yourself. And there are going to be a lot of people out there that tell you, you can't do something or you shouldn't be doing something. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately that's the way our society is, but I guess my point in all of this is to say that you can do that. And you are going to have to fight um, people's preconceived notions and perceptions about having a, dis having a disability. Um, so that being said, over this whole process, I have actually learned how to advocate for myself. And that was a huge thing that took years upon years of learning. As I said, I was embarrassed about this and I didn't want to talk about it. And then I went through actually a severe depression with it. And then after that, I kind of, as I said, 
realized that I had this power. And so I started to tell my story. Um, and essentially, let's see, where am I at? I'm reading through my notes here that I can't see very well. Um, essentially, you know, learning how to advocate for myself, my hope with this whole journey is also, you know, you have to learn how to advocate for yourself and put your own happiness and quality of life first. And then once you've achieved that, the hope is that you can help other people advocate for themselves and kind of maybe pave the way for other people down the road that want to do something similar to what you're doing. Um, let's see. Sorry about that. I'm just reading through some stuff here. Um, so yeah, so anyways, with my own personal goals, you know, I have been able to um, lease out and buy a horse, which I'm very fortunate. Um, and I am competing against able-bodied riders. And that kind of brings me to my work with the para um, sports side of things. So as I said, in North America, there are no opportunities for people with disabilities to jump horses. If they want to jump horses, they're going to be competing against able-bodied riders. There aren't resources, pathways, or comp competition opportunities. Um, and so they're fighting an uphill battle in this sport. Um, so my goal is to essentially get the regulating bodies to um, add the para show jumping discipline to the ruling or to the uh, rule book essentially. So this is a long process. I've been working on this for several years now and it pretty much just takes pounding people and pushing it through and constantly sending emails. Um, and reaching out to people and not being afraid to reach out to people and tell them what you're trying to do, even though in their mind, this has never been done and can't be done. Um, so not being afraid to kind of advocate for what you want to see happen and what you're pushing for. So where we're at right now with the governing bodies is that they are willing to um, discuss this and move forward with this. And COVID kind of threw a wrench in things, but now that horse shows are back up and running, we're gonna be holding some demonstration classes throughout the next year where people with all sorts of disabilities um, are gonna come and put on a demonstration class and show the general public and the equestrian community that jumping horses is both possible and safe. Um, and then from there, they will hopefully add that to the United States Equestrian Federation's rule book. So that's pretty much the work that I've been doing, um, both on a personal level, as well as for the sport of para show jumping. Um, and I guess from there, that's pretty much my story. So I'll open it up for questions. Wow, that's really great. This is Teresa. Yeah. I'm gonna start with a couple of questions. One, um, what types of accommodations are they able to make for you to compete against uh, people that don't have vision impairments? Um, and the second question is um, how other people can get involved if we would like to help you advocate for this. Is there a way that we can support you in that? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so first of all, there are multiple accommodations I have. The main one is actually being able to use a Bluetooth earpiece. So just to give you a little bit of background sort of on how horse shows work, there's a bunch of people and they all go into a warm up arena at one time and there's several jumps set up and there's people left, right and center. And you pretty much come around, you point your horse at the jump and you go for it. Um, the problem for me is that I can't see where the other people are. So I'm having to navigate this arena and ride the horse and jump with all of these other people moving around. So a huge asset for that is having this Bluetooth earpiece where I can essentially be directly connected to my coach who's in my ear and he can tell me, you know, there's someone um, two feet ahead of you off to the left or you need to turn a foot early at a 90 degree angle to get straight to this jump kind of thing. And then further, I'm actually able to use that Bluetooth earpiece when I go into the competition ring. So again, a little bit of background on how I learned my courses and I can go into more detail, but I'm gonna to try to make this very concise is I am, when I compete, I am the only person in the arena. Um, so when I'm going to ride in a new arena, I'll pretty much walk the perimeter of the arena, the quarter and half lines, I divide it up into a grid, doing all of this with an aid. And then I'll go with the aid and stand at every single jump and we'll do a 360 and the aid will tell me, okay, we're at the red jump right now. 
and about seven feet away at this angle is a blue jump and 10 feet away at this angle is a yellow jump. So we do that at every single jump. So I get a really good mental map of where all the objects in the arena are in relation to each other. Then I'll go back and walk the course again with the aid and we'll walk out the striding and pick um, points. So with Stargardt's disease, essentially my central vision is pretty much blank. My peripheral vision is very blurry. And then my brain sort of uses what it does pick up in the periphery, which are these like blurry blobs of color. Um, the more contrast there is, the easier it is for me to make out a blob of color. So, you know, if there's a really big like green sign on the fence rail, I can make out a blob of green. Um, or if the jump is bright red, I can make out a blob of red, even though I can't see any detail about it or what angle it's at or anything like that. But what I can do is I can figure out points to turn. So I know that once I have the green blob in my peripheral vision, I need to turn 30 degrees to the right and then I'll take five horse strides and then I get to the jump. And then I can also kind of make out points on the horizon where there might be a dip in the tree line, which is all blurry, but if it's drastic enough, I can tell that there's a dip or a peak. So again, I, I pick out all of these um, points knowing where to turn and then how many horse strides. So I'll go through a whole process of memorizing um, the entire course, where to turn, how many strides. I'll go back, the aide will draw it out on a large piece of paper or a whiteboard. I'll write out a plan of attack. So I have multiple different steps to make sure that I memorize all these different um, things to be able to go in there on my horse and jump around. That being said, that Bluetooth earpiece is really helpful if something does go wrong. Obviously a horse is an animal and he has his own mind about things. So sometimes, you know, he might not take the right track that I've memorized, or he might put in an extra stride or he might spook at something. So the Bluetooth earpiece is really helpful because my coach can be in my ear the whole time telling me again, as I said, similar to the warm up arena, um, you know, you're going to have to stay out an extra stride, or you're going to have to make a sharper turn left here. Um, or there's an object that I can tell that you can't see, you're going to have to go around it. So stay out for another three strides kind of thing. So that Bluetooth earpiece is the main accommodation. Um, a few other things that I do use are, um, in, so when I'm riding at home, I have, if the, if the jumps aren't really brightly colored, I do have these pieces of massive like paper, I guess, that are brightly colored and I'll put them on the jump standards um, of each jump so that I can kind of make it more clear that there is a, a very significant blob of red color or of yellow color. Um, a few other things that I know different people have used, I haven't gotten into this yet, but I'm interested to do it are, using sound signals to put on the jumps. So one thought that we've had, and again, we just haven't gotten into the technology of this, is to put little noisemakers on each jump. So once you come off of a jump, the coach can press the noisemaker to the next jump so you can point in the direction of where you hear that sound and where you need to go. Um, other less technological ac or, um, accommodations are simply just, you know, going ahead of time to the show managers and the course designers. And this goes more into advocacy for yourself, um, talking to them about your disability and letting them know that you're gonna be using this Bluetooth earpiece. Um, also letting them know that, you know, if they could let the gatekeeper know or different people who are staffing the horse show, um, if you're allowed to go at the beginning of the class or an end of the class so that there aren't as many people around for you to navigate around in the warm up arena. Um, so those are just a few of the accommodations. I know they're not quite as extensive as a lot of the technology a lot of us use, but I hope that answers that question a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and again, that was long winded. <laughs> oh, it's great. I, I'd love all that information. It's very, yeah. very and okay. then let's see, the second quest portion of that question um, was, can you reiterate it for me, please? Yeah, sure. If, if other people with vision impairments want to help with the advocating um, and to, to help you with making that a Paralympic sport, what ways could we help? Yeah. So at this point, um, it's been a, a long time coming and pushing through with those regulating bodies has taken years, honestly, um, to get them to even consider it. But I am in the process of doing a, um, working to put together a nonprofit essentially to be able to support other para show jumping riders. Um, so that is a very slow process as well. There's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, so I am working on that foundation. So once that foundation does come to fruition, I would love it if everyone would, um, help share it, you know, just put word out about it. 
Um, of course, equestrian sports are incredibly expensive, as everyone knows. Um, so there is also the financial aspect of that, of course, you know, being able to um, get funding, both a lot of para riders essentially have both sponsors as well as private donors to help them be able to alleviate their training and competition um, and horse care costs. So that's always helpful, um, although a bit more difficult. But yeah, as far as just helping with it, it's mostly raising awareness about it. And once, you know, more information comes out about the foundation and once we have some demonstration classes on the books, helping share that and just kind of showing your support in any way you can, whether it's on social media, showing up in person once we have the demo classes things like that. I'm sorry, I have one more quick question. And we'll no, take that's other fine. Yeah. That, you had mentioned uh, about a demonstration where other people with disabilities would demonstrate show, um, show jumping and things like that. Mm -hmm. Is that already a date uh, scheduled? Where would that be? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so right now we are in the very initial stages of talking to some of the horse show organizers in North America. Um, there's a little bit of bureaucracy involved with this because the United States Equestrian um, Federation is, they can't officially say that they acknowledge it yet because there's a whole lot more um, going on in the background where they have a lot of, um, I guess like board members and people, supporting them. So they have to be very careful about how they go about this. Um, so we are talking to some show organizers. We haven't officially announced any dates yet, but we should be in the next month or two. Um, and once those dates are on the books, then I can share them with you. <laughs> will that be here in Lexington? Um, one or two of the demonstration classes will be, yes. They will Wonderful. be at the Kentucky Horse Park. Great, we'll be looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you. And Richard, if you want to call on people that might have their hands raised. I don't see anybody who has a hand raised yet, but if I may, I do have a question as well. Yeah. Um, and we, we would, of course, be happy to share any information that you give to us uh, once you have your not -for profit up off the ground. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the community who would want to be aware of it. I just Thank want to you. put that out there also just to say that. Um, but I have a friend who is crazy about horses and she would love to do what you're doing. Um, yeah. what, would you, what advice would you give to somebody who doesn't have the means to, to own their own horse and get involved uh, doing what you're doing? Absolutely. Yeah, that is a great question. And I realize that I am very fortunate to be able to do this um, and that most people don't have those opportunities. So some of the options would be um, just going and taking some initial lessons. So there are farms, a lot of farms in Lexington and all over Kentucky, I imagine, um, where they do one-off lessons. So those lessons aren't super expensive. You pretty much go, you call around, you find a place um, where you kind of, you talk to the trainer or the coach and you get a feel for them. Maybe you go out beforehand and visit the farm and just see if you get a good feel for it. And then from there, you can set up a lesson. So a lot of these programs have what they call school or lesson horses. So those horses are owned by the farm and they are specifically used for people that don't have their own horses to go take lessons. So you can set up a one-off lesson. Um, you could do it at multiple different farms. You could continue to take lessons at the same farm, but that's kind of a great introductory way for people to get into the sport and just see if they even like it, honestly. Um, so if she does want more resources, um, also depending, you know, on what discipline she wants to do, there's all sorts of stuff in the equestrian world, everything from jumping to dressage, which is all on the flat. It's like horse dancing, there's Western riding, um, all sorts of different options. Um, so I'd be happy to talk with her more directly if she wants some more info on that and pass along some resources. I would appreciate it if you passed along your contact information to me. And Absolutely. I'll, I'll pass yeah. that along to her and Great. she can get in contact with you. Um, she's crazy, just crazy about horses. And yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> stuff on Facebook all the time. And I know that she would love to do anything in the Inquestrian world. She just can't afford to do it. And so, right, of course. Um, she's yeah, an, absolutely. an old friend of mine from way back. Sure, sure. Um, awesome. Another question um, regarding para, the para side of this. Are you guys going to have, I, forgive me, I don't know a lot about okay. stuff myself, um, but 
but is there like a team or um, something that you guys, you know, are getting together that she could join or, or are you guys trying to recruit people to, to be involved in that way as well or? Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know if that question made any sense. But. Yeah, no, it, it definitely does. Um, and I get that question a lot, actually. So one of the hardest parts about para jumping is that it doesn't exist yet. So it's completely uncharted territory. And even if you don't know anything about equestrian sport, this would be similar to taking a sport that literally does not exist. Um, and trying to push it through the regulating bodies to be an official sport. So as I said, it's uncharted territory. So I kind of um, decided that I was gonna take this on a few years ago and start reaching out to the regulating bodies, but there's no map for what to do or how to go about it. Um, So what I've kind of been trying to do is follow Great Britain's model, who's at the forefront of the movement, and they actually officially recognize it along with other um, European countries. But just sort of following their model on how they got it to be an official sport and what steps they took, which is why I'm trying to do the demonstration classes. Um, At this point, because it's not an officially recognized sport, there is no team, there is no league, there aren't any official opportunities to be involved with it, with it, which is the whole problem. Um, so at this point with where we're at, because it's not officially recognized, there's no way to actually be a part of a team. That being said, I do have a database of riders um, and people interested. So if you do want to get put on that list, I would be happy to do that. There is a Facebook page that's called Para Show Jumping North America. You can also join that. And we do regular updates kind of on where the movement is um, and what we're trying to do next. So you can also join that, which I'm happy to, to um, pass along the link to that. But again, it's it's so, um, it's it's uncharted territory and it's in its infancy. So at this point, it's very difficult to give a direct answer on how exactly to get involved because we're not quite at that point yet where we have a team or a league. So I wish I had better information. If you wanna at this point, go ahead and give your website and Facebook page and any of those. um, We have one more question. Actually, Paula Paula Wise has a question. Yeah. I wanna do. Very interesting, Ran. Uh, Richard, I know this is not on the level that Ren is riding right now, but is your friend familiar with Central Kentucky Riding for Hope? You're asking me? Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, she's just, I mean, she's an old high school friend from way back, and I'm just, I hear her talk about this all the time. I know that's it's been a dream of hers, and I figured since how I was, you know, on, on the a Zoom meeting with somebody who's you know, basically forging new territory, I would um, just ask what what information I could on her behalf. Um, I didn't Is think she in like, Lexington. She was in Louisville. Oh, wow. Well. I don't yeah. know if there's anything in Louisville or not. At Rand, yeah, I, would, know. I urged her to reach out to Churchill Downs because I didn't know anybody else at the time um, who was doing anything. And um, she just I, she, she does writing lessons and whatnot, but I think but but um, I'm not sure what else she's she's doing. I just I love to see people do things like this, you know, forging new territory as we all do. And um, because it's, it's definitely needed. Have right. you reached out, if I may ask a question also, again, I, I hate to monopolize. Um, but have you reached out to the uh, uh, the Paralympics people or the uh, Special Olympics people or anything like that? Is is that? something else that you guys are looking into? And then I'll, I'll, I'll let Marty answer, ask his question after that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so really quickly, uh, I think it was Paula, forgive me if I'm getting the name wrong. Yes. Central yes. Kentucky Riding for Hope is also a great um, suggestion. So I appreciate you bringing that up. I totally forgot about it. Um, they are based at the Kentucky Horse Park and they do a lot of different programs, actually. I don't know the breadth of what they do, but I know they do have a therapeutic riding program. They work with veterans um, and I think they do a few other things as well. So that would definitely be a great resource as well. Um, Again, it is in Lexington, but that being said, they might also be able to connect her with other ways to get involved. So I I love that suggestion. (laughs) Um, Have you uh, had a, a, a strong response from other visually impaired people who would be interested in this? Yes, I definitely have. Um, To answer that really quick, and then I'll get back to the previous question. I get inundated with 
um, both people with visual impairments and blindness, as well as parents of kids who have gotten diagnosed on social media. And I love it because I think it's so cool to be able to, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but like to be able to kind of forge a path for other people that otherwise wouldn't think they could do that, especially younger kids. Um, because right now, so many people that I hear about have been told that they can't do it or it doesn't exist and it's not possible. Um, and so to kind of get those messages from people that they maybe went out and tried it or tried something different just because they heard about my story is incredibly humbling and it's really cool. Um, so I've gotten amazing feedback from blind and visually impaired people. There are actually a lot of us out there who do ride horses. Um, there's an entire equestrian, um, visually impaired blind equestrian Facebook group actually. So there's definitely great, been great feedback about that. Um, going back to the previous question, I am forgetting what it was. Can you reiterate it really quick? Oh, me? Uh, yes. About the um, Special Olympics and the Paralympics? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, so to answer your question on that front, there is a progression of how to get a sport officially recognized. So the way that works is that... Um, it would normally start at the grassroots level, then the national regulating body in a country recognize it, recognizes it. Then from there, um, as far as equestrian sport goes at least, the international regulating body is called FEI, it's Federation Equestrian Internationale. Um, they want around seven countries to officially recognize it nationally for them to consider it internationally. Then from there, what would happen is once the international regulating body, FEI, recognizes it, then they will go on to the Paralympic and Olympic Committee and try to push it through from that end. So there's definitely a progression of who you need to go through and what steps you need to take for it to be escalated throughout the um, kind of hierarchies and levels of the sport. That being said, um, I actually recently was talking to someone who's working on Special Olympics um, New York in their equestrian um, organization. And I have not reached out to Special Olympics here in Kentucky, I need to do that. But I do know that they have an equestrian um, program of some sort. I've started to research it, um, but I definitely need to look into that more because I think there might be some really great opportunities there as well for people. Are there other countries that do recognize it yet? Yes, um, Great Britain, as I said, is at the forefront of the movement. France and Germany for sure recognize it. I think there's a few others, but again, it's it's this little bit of a um, ambiguous territory where people don't really talk about it a lot. Um, and a lot of you know people are a little bit secretive about it for some reason. Um, I think that's just because there's so much societal pushback to people with disabilities doing such a dangerous sport. Um, mm -hmm. But there are several countries over in Europe that recognize it. Good, so you have a good start to get yes. it recognized. Yes, now. and I mean, the regulating body here is very open to it. I've um, gotten really positive feedback from them over the past two years. So they're definitely on board with it and they're excited to help push it through, which is awesome to hear. So I definitely mm -hmm. have support from them. Okay, Marty, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> yeah, I just figured I'd let y'all get all your questions in there first. Um, and my question is this, it's kind of a, maybe a dumb question, but- Not at all. Okay, okay. I, I, used to, I used to jump motorcycles and jump ramps. Oh, cool. Time. And um, I know staying on the bike is like, you know, with the inertia and the, and the momentum keeps you in the, in the saddle. But, um, and I know on a horse, you put your feet in the stirrups and you're hanging on to the uh, reins or, or do you hang on to the, um, the uh, saddle horn to stay in, mm -hmm. in there? How do you stay in the saddle? I'm just curious. Yeah. <laughs> that is an excellent question. Um, so really quickly, when you said you jump motorcycles, was that like dirt bikes? Well, both, yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, interestingly enough, and I only know this because my boyfriend used to do motocross and do that, um, the position that equestrians Put their bodies in to jump is very similar to that of jumping motorcycles so you yeah. sort of um you're using your center of weight you know farther down your body and your hips and your legs and yeah. with a horse um you're trying to keep your heels down so right. essentially you are squeezing with your legs you're having that point of contact with your legs and your feet and your heels are down yeah. and as the horse jumps over the jump you pretty much try to maintain that position yeah. um that right. being said 
the horses that jump a lot harder, it's not easy to stay on because as you know, mm-hmm. there's so much momentum going up off the ground right. that pushes you up with the horse. Um, I personally use magnetic stirrups. So okay. I have boots that have magnets on the bottom, on the bottom of them. And then the stirrups are also magnetic. So when my boot is Ooh. in the stirrup, there is that magnetic field that sort of keeps me in the, in the stirrups, um, it helps because my horse jumps really hard, but yeah. there have definitely been times, um, even with those magnetic stirrups where I've just been launched through the air. Um, oh, yeah. And if the horse is jumping hard enough, like there's no way to stay on. So yeah, a lot yeah. of it is position um, and yeah. just making sure that your weight is down, your heels are down and trying to keep the correct position. Yeah. But that's a great question. I was wanting to know when you said you use magnets on your shoes and stuff. How do you get off on off the horse? <laughs> yeah, it, that's, that's good that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so they are um, they're very strong magnets, and essentially you actually have to reach down with your hand and pull the stirrup off of your boot. So uh-huh. it does take some force. Um, they have been designed where if you do fall off, if your boot goes at a certain angle to the stirrup. Like if it, if enough pressure is put on it to kind of um, tear it off, it will, the, the magnet, um, the magnetic field will break, but again, it is pretty strong. So when you're just getting on and off the horse, you have to pull the magnets off. Um, Okay. Yeah. That's a really good question. Thanks. Yeah. This is Gary. I've got a question. Uh, Uh Do you do only stadium jumping? Uh, have you yes. ever tried any cross country in your I, sport? I have actually. That's a great question. Um, so, with a, and it sounds like you know a little bit more about equestrian sport. Um, cross country is part of a discipline called eventing. So, in eventing, it's kind of the triathlon of equestrian sport, um, as I'm sure you know, where they do flat work, which is dressage, cross country, and then stadium jumping or show jumping, which is what I do. So, I personally only do show jumping, which is a different discipline from eventing, which is a triathlon. Um, That being said, I have tried cross country before. And the way it worked actually was that I was on my horse and I had someone else on a different horse and I rode about like two feet off to the right behind them. So as they would go around the cross country course and they would go over these cross country jumps, I was just kind of right off behind to the right of them so I could follow their movement. So I could tell out of my peripheral vision that the movement of the horse in front of me was there. And then I could also hear where the horse was. So I was able to follow that person around the cross country course. And it was really fun, I have to say. Um, the one thing about cross country jumps and they've changed them a little now where they do come down, but a lot of them are stationary. So if you hit the jump, it does not fall down. Whereas in the arena jumping, if you hit a rail on a jump, it will actually fall down. So it's a little bit safer to do the arena jumping. Um, it's also a little bit easier for me because the jumps are brightly colored, whereas a lot of cross country jumps are natural colored. So they blend in in a little bit more. So it's hard for me to make out those bright, um, blobs of color and the contrast in color. So I hope that answers the question. That does. Uh, the, the reason I said I've, I have had an opportunity, uh, haven't for the last two years, but before that for about four years, I had a chance to go and be at the three-day event. Yes. And so uh, I had awesome. a friend that uh, drove the the little scooters back and forth, hauling people back and forth to the parking lots Plus, he provided the big floral arrangements that were in some of the special uh, event tents. Oh, neat! And so I got to uh, watch, you know, parts of the cross country, you know, the different days that I was there. Mm-hmm. So that was That's just awesome. Because it, because uh, that would be a difficult, unless you were having to follow the horse or or have your trainer with you, following you. And telling you where the where you were headed, right? You know, exactly. it would be almost impossible to do because that's a two or three mile course. Right. Yes, you are correct. Um, and I actually believe it or not, do know of multiple visually impaired riders who do cross country and eventing at a lower level. Um, and they go through extensive amounts of memorization. Some of them use that Bluetooth earpiece where their trainer is driving along on a golf cart next to them or near them, um, telling them where to go, where to turn. 
um, things like that. So yes, you're correct. That's incredibly difficult because those horses, when you're doing cross country, I mean, you're going for miles. Um, so the memorization on that would have to be incredibly significant. Um, and pretty uh, difficult, don't... I imagine. And I watched them <laughs> set it up and they, they had the, they didn't put the, some of the jumps out until the night before. Right. Yeah. So you don't even know what you're going to be jumping. You just know where you're supposed to go. Um, right. Yeah. No, that's, it's impressive what they do. And those jumps are massive. <laughs> so yes. <they> are. yes. <laughs> but that's really neat that you got to go there. Um, this is like a little sneak preview. Um, but the Kentucky three day is actually one of the places where we will possibly be holding some demonstration classes. So in some of their um, demo arenas and things like that. So, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Doesn't sound like we have any other questions, but that's all so exciting. And uh, we wish you the best of luck with it. And yeah. we can definitely share on social media as you get things up and going, um, please let us know and we'll be happy to share and help you promote it as Thank much you. as we can. And um, we do have some door prizes and I have my video turned off so I can hold my phone up close and count through. So um, Ren, if you would, um, I'm gonna ask if you would select a number between one and 10 and I will count through our participants here and we'll pick um, whatever number we land on we only for have some door prizes. <laughs> I, I'll just keep counting through until we, to okay. we'll, so if you wanna just pick a number between one and 10. Let's do six. Okay. Uh, that would be Marty Smith, and we have two different prizes, Marty. We have the um, Bluegrass Council of the Blind ball cap that is uh, kind of a coral color with blue lettering stitched on Bluegrass Council of the Blind, and on the back of it, it has stitched out of sight. Um, which if anybody wins that and doesn't want it, I'll buy it from you because I would love to have one. <laughs> and then the other prize is um, this cute basket that Brie put together. And it's, it's a cleanup kit. It's got um, all kinds of cleaning items like uh, scented hand soap, Dawn dishwashing liquid, Tide, uh, a small travel size Tide and um, individual packs of sanitizing hand wipes and all kinds of cool little cleanup items. So which of those would you like, Marty? You get to take a pick since you were first. Yes, I'll take the hat. The hat? Yes. Yeah. The hat. Okay. And then Ren, if you want to pick one other number. Let's do... Three. Okay. Well, that's you, Ren. So oh, no. <laughs> you want to go one that. up or go one up or one below? Let's go one below. One below would be Bree Sweet. <laughs> Bree, get your package you put together. <laughs> Woohoo, I love it when I win. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much. Let me see if I can get back to, let's see, close this. Well, I'm not able to close my screen. There we go. So um, thank you so very much for sharing your story. It sounds like you've got some amazing accomplish accomplishments under your belt as well as some really exciting things ahead. And please do keep us posted. I definitely will. Thank and you. And thank you guys for listening. <laughs>
Yeah, and we will have this recording will go up on our YouTube page from Bluegrass Council of the Blind. So if you want to share it with anyone or if um, any of our current participants want to uh, have a copy of it or share it with their friends, it is usually up usually by tomorrow. Um, and we'll be happy to share that link um, in our November newsletter as well. And as far as announcements go, uh, we also being that is our blind ability celebration. If anybody else had any other uh, stories or people that they wanted to briefly recognize today, um, we'll open the floor if anybody wants to share anything regarding um, that. I know normally we have some things planned and I apologize, I didn't uh, have any others lined up for today, but anybody want to share any blind ability stories? I got one. I'll give you one. Go ahead, Marty. Can I ask one more quick question before we switch, switch over to Marty? I'll do it. Um, sure. Were there any websites or anything uh, that you would like to share before we switch away from you as the main speaker? Yes, um, I, and I forgot to mention this. So my personal website is renblay.com. That's spelled W-R-E-N-B-L-A-E.com. Um, I do have a Instagram page. It's also renblay or just renblay um, on Facebook, also under renblay. And then the name of the Paris show jumping um, Facebook page is Paris Show Jumping North America. Um, so you can find that on Facebook. I do have a small YouTube channel just with some of my equestrian rounds. Um, and once I do come up with that foundation and have everything put together, I will be happy to share the link to that. But if any of you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to me on social media um, or by email, phone, whatever it is. I'm sure you guys can pass along the contact info for that. Um, my email is on my website as well. So yeah, so if anyone ever has any questions or wants to talk more, um, please feel free to reach out. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Mark. Oh, I'm waiting for my uh, phone company to come with my phone up. Well, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, well, I guess he's answering the phone. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, my, um, what my story thing is like, it relates to what Rand said about uh, struggling with the books and things and uh, and to change her. Uh, from, from doing what she wanted to do to something right else to, to one one once she tried changed over to horse riding from whatever she said she was doing before she's going after um <clears throat> well and, and my my story is like this when i was in college um i was taking a um computer class because i had to i had to go through this database section and and everybody in class was finishing first, you know, like 30 minutes they were done. It's taking me three hours to get through the, the database because my uh, screen reader was so slow. You know, Jaws is slow. And, and, you know, me finding what I'm looking for with one, you know, arrow keys and stuff. Anyway, um, so I changed my major so I could stick with, uh, you know, staying in school and, and do the same thing what I wanted, wanted to do, which is write for television, which I haven't done it yet, but I'm still working on it. Um, so I figured I'd change my major to, uh, theater. So I did. And, and, um, so I, I finished my degree in theater and, uh, didn't have to do any more computer stuff as far as, you know, keeping up with the class and stuff. And so, so, um, I, I understand about, um, uh, how she, she changed, you know, from one thing to, uh, to another because of her disability. And so did I, so I, I can relate to that. And, um, but, um, and then also, I, I used to be in a Athena club, which is a, a club of uh, people made up of various disabilities. And our goal, was we go around to different schools and things, talking about our disabilities and how we got our, I got in school and 
accomplish our goals, you know, through different ways of doing things, but getting it done. And that's the main thing is, is you know, you got to do things a little bit different, but still get it done. It just takes a little intestinal fortitude. And, uh, well, basically, that's my story. So I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Marty. Can I say something really quick? Yeah. Marty, I love that. Um, and I respect, you know, you being willing to tell that story because I know sometimes a lot of people when they have a disability and they feel that they need to change what they're doing. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, back when I was a little bit younger, um, felt like I was failing. And I think it's important to realize that exactly what you said, you know, we might do things in different ways, but we can still do them. And sometimes we just have to make a decision about maybe taking a different path. And that doesn't mean that we're failing. It doesn't mean that it's not okay. We just decide what's right for us and what's right for our disability at that time. And I respect you for doing that, you know, and figuring out how to um, finish college and deciding to change your major. So I really do respect you for that. Um, and I also love you, what you talked about, about the club, about talking about how we do things differently. You know, there's so many things that I do very strangely and people who are normal, if you will, look at me and they're like, why are you doing that? But we still come to the same end goal. And you know, it's okay for people to do things differently and we're going to be doing things differently. But the fact that we do accommodate and we adapt and we figure out how to do that is the most important part. So I really love that and what you said. So thanks for sharing. Thank you. That's so true, Ren. And you know, the whole world is starting to kind of see that for themselves with the pandemic, the, the rest of the world has had to pivot and change how they do things um, with having to learn to do things remotely and via Zoom and, um, you know, just distribution, getting things places, everything's really changed. So I think it's kind of given the world the opportunity to see kind of what we have had to do with dealing with a disability and, you know, just like you and Marty and many other people having to kind of make a shift. And you, you look at like, okay, here's the current situation. It's not the same as it was six months ago or two years ago. And so We've got to make new decisions based on what our current situation is. And I think that the world's become a little bit more accepting um, and understanding of us having to do that because now they're kind of faced with it in a different circumstance. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Thanks for sharing that, Marty. Does anyone else have a story they'd like to share before we close our meeting for today? give everybody the opportunity to unmute because I know sometimes it's kind of hard to get, get that button to unmute. Come on, Gary. I know you got a story. <laughs> I'm going to Gary, stay out of it today. Uh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you everybody for sharing. Richard, if you want to go ahead and stop the recording, we can um, wrap it up here.